a lot of what's come up in these weekly face-to-faces as we talk about our projects is so many of us are making personal documentaries. And um, I've, uh, you know, I know the challenges firsthand of making them. I've made four, I'm working on my fifth. And um, I, I've long wanted to do a special focused um, topic on it. So at last the day is here. And I couldn't think of two better people to um, two more like just, you know, stellar practitioners of the art form than, than Judith Helfand and Yancey Ford. So I wanna talk about our first personal docs, you know, and, and, and Yancey, unless I'm wrong, Strong mm-hmm. Island is just the only personal doc, but it's your, you know, and I don't know if the new one is a personal doc in any way. No, not at all. In no, okay. in no way, shape or form. <laughs> one and done. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about these first ones, though. Um, nobody, no, nobody I know grows up saying, I want to grow up and be a personal doc filmmaker. Um, no one. Um, and yet, you know, we have this story about our lives and you know, whether we like it or not, it has to be told from a, a first person perspective. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I want to know for each of you, what was, what was the impetus for doing the first one? Um, what, you know, made you decide that you just, you had to make it. And with, with Judith, we're talking about a healthy baby girl, right? Yeah. Like That's in the nine, in the nineties, <laughs> remember the nineties. <90s>. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Do you want to go first? No, no, please. I'd love to hear you talk about a healthy baby girl. It's one of my favorite talks. Oh, um, well, yeah, I definitely did not. I mean, the last thing I could have ever imagined was that my middle-class Jewish family would have any sort of universal struggle that would be important enough to have any kind of movie made about us. I mean, I was trying to get away from Long Island and get away from my parents and I mean, I love them, but there was nothing, there was no struggle happening as far as I could see, you know, other than, you know, maybe my dad struggling around work. Um, But, you know, I didn't understand anything really systemic about what was completely going on in the world or our even our niche of the world in Merrick Long Island. Like I wasn't looking at that. I was looking to leave and I was looking to, I did want to be a social change documentary filmmaker and that I knew since I was 16, but the only change that I thought and struggle that I thought was happening was far away from us. But while I was working on a film about the treatment and mistreatment of people with schizophrenia and the homeless mentally ill for frontline of all places, Um, I was diagnosed with cancer because of a drug that my mother had taken when she was pregnant with me um, in 1962 and 63. And that drug was called diethylstilbestrol, um, the first synthetic hormone that was ever created. And it was touted as a major league wonder drug and millions and millions of women in North America for the most part and in some parts of Western Europe, you know, Uh, and in military bases all over the United States were consuming this drug because it was the best prenatal care money could buy. And they were afraid of having a miscarriage or their doctor just wanted them to be on the safe side. They were administered this. And it wasn't until 1971 when I was eight that my mother read in the New York Times that this story broke and there was a link between people who took this drug and this rare form of cancer that was happening in teenage girls who were exposed in utero. So, you know, I knew from the time I didn't, I knew from the time I was 14 because she waited all those years to tell me, but she knew that I had this time bomb ticking in my body, but we all were under the impression that if you sort of got past 18, 20, and you didn't have cancer, you were over the hump and you probably wouldn't get it. So long story short, I volunteered to work on a film about DES cancer because I thought I have a little time in between my work. I'm good at archival research. I don't want to get cancer. I'll just lend my time. And they said, you know, if you want to work with us, you have to go get a checkup. And so I did, and I wound up getting diagnosed with the same cancer they were making the movie about. So they turned the camera on me at my invitation. 
And I started associate producing the film that was about me where I thought I was going to go home with a crew and tell my mother the worst news ever. And then my therapist was like, no, you go home by yourself. What are you fucking talking about? You can't do that. So I had to go and find the, the director of this movie in the balcony of the Beacon Theater where she was watching a show to whisper, get in between the aisles and say, I don't think you could come home with me tomorrow. I'm about to tell my mother the worst thing that ever happened in the entire world. I'll tell her that we're gonna film, but no camera. She was like, okay. So I went home to tell my mom the worst news that she'd ever consumed, which now that I'm a mother, I can't even imagine, I can't imagine feeling like I'd harm my daughter and that if she wanted to have children one day, biologically, that would not be the case, let alone that the cancer could kill her, which was really what my mother was thinking, not so much about the baby. I was obsessed about babies. Um, so I told my mother the worst news ever. And then I said, but I think we should document it because this is this is a big deal. This isn't just about us. And um, she looked at me like I was crazy, but she really couldn't say no at that point because everything was shutting down around me. And I will end it with, uh, so this, it's like, it's not a, like the, it's not a story that I went to look for. It literally fell out of my belly, so to speak. And I made it, I had to make it in the end one, because the people that were making this movie, bless their souls, they were kind of focused on the wrong drama. And the real drama was going home to heal in the house that I was brought up in, in the very room that my mother had brought me home to as an infant, sleeping in the same space where my crib had been, but trying to make sense of a radical hysterectomy and pharmaceutical malfeasance and how this corporation got inside my body and why my mother was so guilty she could barely speak and I was in such, such deep grief and afraid to show it to her. So the camera became the witness that this was part of the public record. And it was the reminder to me and my mother that if the camera was there, it was not her fault. And my grief was bigger than me. And it took five years to make, and it's a, it's, it saved our lives. And I found out she had great comic timing and we were funny. <laughs> Thanks. Yancy, did you, <laughs> did you know ever since your, brother's murder that you wanted to make a film about it? Yeah, you know, um, Judith, I love hearing that. I didn't realize that you were working on a project about the same cancer and that you invited the, the I, I had no idea of the origin um, the, uh, of, of uh, the healthy baby girl. Um, it's an incredible story. Um, my brother was killed when I was 19 and I was studying art um, and creative writing um, in, in college. I was, you know, clearly set on making a lot of money um, after I graduated. Um, and I, I started making work about his death and I knew that I needed it to be bigger than what um, I had been able to do as a student. Um, it didn't occur to me um, that I could actually make the film, even though I had, I had thought of making the film it didn't actually occur to me that I could do it um, until I took the Third World Newsreel production workshop and I learned how to shoot on a Bolex 16 millimeter camera um, and I learned how to edit on a Steenbeck and I made a short film about my dad. Um, and after I made that short film about my father, I knew that I was gonna be able to do the film about William. Now, that was, the, the practical side of it. Um, the, the flip side of, of the practical um, journey to making the film was the, you know, getting to the place where I was personally ready to make the film. Um, and, you know, so, and that took me, you know, a few years between that workshop and when I actually started shooting. Um, I had been working at POV, watching documentaries, I had been, you know, 
I had been like the Grim Reaper, you know, I sent people their rejection letters or I called people who had made it to the final round but didn't get picked and said how sorry I was. And um, one of the things that I learned and saw while I was at POV is that people were, people were, people were really um, taking incredible risks and doing incredibly like bold work um, to tell really challenging stories. Some of them were personal, some of them were not. Um, and it got to a point where I just said, you know what, who am I to be sitting here um, passing judgment on these filmmakers acting as a gatekeeper? Even though, I, even though that was my job, I was, I was just like, I'm sitting on a secret that I'm afraid to tell. And in the meantime, I'm watching all of these films come through the door, watching all of this remarkable work seeing all of the examples of the way in which you could choose to say yes to making a film. Um, and I just said to myself, you know what, I'm not going to hide behind, I'm not going to beh hide behind my fear anymore. Um, and that's when I started making um, Strong Island. I, I borrowed a camera, I, I borrowed a, a Panasonic P2 camera from Josh Gilbert, um, may he rest in peace. Um, and started doing um, uh, just you know handheld interviews with my mother that have never seen the light of day um, and it really got me to understand that she was ready to tell the story um, but then I had to get myself to a place where I was sort of technically able to, to tell the story so I did my own shooting um, for a while um, and then I brought on Slavomir Grunberg to shoot my very first um, like trailer for the film. We shot interview with my mother, interview with my sister. Um, that trailer has also never seen the that sample has never seen the light of day. It was used for fundraising. Um, and then when I got a little bit of money, um, I, I looked for a DP, and then we just started going out to my, to my mother's house, um, like every weekend. Um, and we did, you know. It, different iterations of going to so-and-so's house or, or having, you know, someone so meet us for an interview every weekend for years. Um, and it took me 10 years because I, I worked full-time um, at POV for the first, um, for the first five years of making the film, um, maybe even six years. Um, and then I was able to, after I got a Ford Foundation grant, I was able to carve out a little salary for myself so that I could work on the film and finish it. Um, yeah, but that's how, that's how I got from, um, you know, this 19-year-old art student who was just like, fuck, what just happened to my life, um, to Strong Island. You know, you both talk about having your mothers on board from the beginning, but what, what about other family members? What do you do? if you run up against pushback from some family members? How do you deal with even like release forms? Do you um, get them? I, I, I get my family to sign release forms like right at the start. Um, yeah, everybody signed releases for me. I, I was just like, gotta sign this. Cause I, cause I knew, cause you know, of what I did at POV, I was like, someone's gonna ask me for a release form at some point if, if, you know, if this goes well. Um, and, and I was lucky not to have any family resistance. Um, you know, my father had passed away, um, you know, years before, and my sister, though she was reluctant, um, she wanted to be supportive, and you know, I got the permission that I needed from her. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I'm just—it's not always just about the. Re I mean, the release forms sometimes are the easiest things. You know, like getting your mother to agree to lend you their only equity as in their family home so you could take the vinyl off and put on a on a, <laughs> a you know reclaimed wood um that's a really hard ask <laughs> and have workers at the house for probably two months and make her life kind of miserable though the outside of the house will look like it belongs you know on Martha's Vineyard um so you know when you when I got that you know there's moments when I got resistance from my mom particularly around blue vinyl and by that time my father who was really into that movie he became my secret my secret stealth weapon so you know i'd say to him like 
can't you just whisper to her in the middle of the night? Florence, just give her the vinyl. Just give her the vinyl. It'll be okay. I love you. Give her the vinyl. And um, or and it's you know, and he'd say, um, oh, I'll consider that. But then there were moments when my mother, like, even when she was like, All right, we did a healthy baby girl. Can you just leave me alone now? And my father said, You know, Florence, that was your movie. Blue vinyl, it's my movie. This is about the outside of the house. We did the inside of the house. This is about the outside of the house. She's like, well, leave me out of it, obviously. So I, you know, I think that there is often reticence and sometimes reticence becomes part of the story and it's a good part of the story. And it's actually a really efficient and important part of the story that speaks to, that speaks to the stakes, that speaks to the service of having, you know, the camera around that speaks to sometimes it's confusing. Am I talking to my daughter? Am I talking to a filmmaker who's in my house? Why is this crew in the backyard? Why does she keep bringing these experts over? Okay, enough. I know we made a mistake about the outside of the house, but must you remind me of it, mm. you know, every weekend? So, but actually it was useful for that movie. I don't, I don't suggest that reticence is everybody is part of everyone's narrative, but sometimes it's useful. You do need the release form, but I did get the vinyl ultimately. It's an interesting point about reticence because I made a, a documentary called The Kids Grow Up about my daughter growing up in her last year at home before she went off to college and the, the separation process and all that. And I remember her telling me at one point after I'd done an interview that you know, ugh, I, I, you know, I'm not giving you what you want. You're like, I'm not even answering your questions. And I said, no, like, evading the answers is perfect. I mean, that's that's what teenagers do. <laughs> they never articulate to their parents what they're feeling, you know. So, so, so good. But you know, permissions were 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 tricky. I'd say dealing with kids is actually really tough in this matter because I didn't, um, I didn't want her to sign a release form until she was 18 and we had to be, you know, I, I, I gave her the permission to pull the plug on the film at two different points, you know, one during the filming. And um, I remember, I remember she left for college and I, I, before I got the significant funding while I was working on the work in progress sample to raise money. Um, when she first came home on vacation, I had her see it. And I, I put together some of the worst parts just for her, you know, parts that I thought she might be most upset with. And I just said, okay, here's your other chance. I mean, like, if this is going to ruin your life, tell me now, because I, I can't go out and raise all this money and then have you tell me later that it's destroying my life. Um, and luckily she said, no, it's, you know, it's okay. She didn't love it, you know. It was it was it was very hard for her, and it, it was a process of years of working out her conflicted feelings about being part of it. Um, so it's really tricky. I don't know if you guys give the same advice when you're approached by filmmakers, but I certainly tell anybody who tells me about the story, no matter how remarkable, that their mother or their father doesn't want it made, that there's just no way you can make it. You know tell it in a different medium or, you know, write about it or, or, or do something. I mean, do you agree? I mean, is it possible to make a film without the cooperation of your family if you're doing it about the family? Is it possible? Yeah. By the way, Yancy, yeah, somebody, some, somebody asked if you could sit a little closer to your mic or speak. Oh, sorry, 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 um, sorry. Is it possible? I, I, I think it's possible. Is it wise? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, it's funny. I, um, you know, the things that the people that I did have to work on were not, you know, quote, technically family, but they were like my brother's family. They were his really close friends, people that I hadn't spoken to um, since the years after his murder. Um, and it wouldn't have been the same film without Kevin, uh, you know, who was with my brother um, when, when he was shot. It wouldn't have been the same film without his friend Harvey, with whom um, he, you know, sort of went through freshman year at Howard University with um, 
it wouldn't have been the same without those people. Um, you know, I think that there's so many f dynamics within the family about who gets to tell the story of the family, that that's actually the, the thing for me that is the nut to crack. Um, and I think that a lot of times, like with, with Strong Island, one of the things that I was wrestling with was, is this, you know, like, am, who am I to, to tell the story, right? Like, but then at a certain point it became clear that, you know, if, if I didn't do it, I didn't know who else would or at what juncture. So that's why I made the decision to step in. I don't know what I would have done. Um, actually, I do know what I would have done. If my mother hadn't wanted me to make the film, I might have waited until her death to make the film. That's honestly what I, I might have done. And you would have been all right about using the interviews you shot with her previously? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, for me, I was, I, I you know, my, my sister's, my sister's kind of, a, you know, not as large of a character in the film as um, she might otherwise have been because I was concerned about, um, you know, how she would feel about her seeing herself portrayed on film. Um, I would have been fine, and, and, and she's fine with that. And with my mother, I think I would have been fine using material because I think that her decision not to participate would have been one that was driven by fear and the same fear that drove her silence for so many years. Um, and that's why, for me, um, I, I ultimately, I mean, it's, it's also something I would have discussed with my sister, but it ultimately would have been something that I would, would have felt okay with. Um, but I'm really fortunate that I didn't wind up in that situation at all. Um, I'm really fortunate that my mother, you know, welcomed us in, like into her house and into her life um, and into her story in the way that she did. Um, Can I add something? Yes, yes, you may. Well, I just, I wanna say two things. Sometimes their no isn't really a full no. <laughs> you know, sometimes no is, this is your way of dealing with things. This isn't necessarily my way of dealing with things. You're in the generation of therapy. I'm in the generation of trying to get over it and eating it and processing it differently. But if this is gonna help you, I'm not gonna say I'm comfortable, but I love you. So I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no, I'm saying I love you. And, you know, I knew that. And I, deep in my heart, I really, really understood that, that this film would save my soul and save my mother's, save my relationship with my mother. And without making a healthy baby girl, I would have gone to the, to a very, very, very dark place. And I would have felt that the, the, the physical, emotional, spiritual, uh, familial, legacy, ethical, sacrifices that we were making were like totally in vain and you know if i was a paint really a painter i paint a little bit like i would have painted it if i was a writer i would have written it like if i was a lawyer i would have been a litigator like this is who i am i'm a storyteller and i and and i learned how to make personal films because that's what i could do but i had to do something with it and i also felt like someone once said like boy did they give des to the wrong mother right and in a way i was like well yeah at least like i know so many des cancer daughters who are in such shambles and their relationships with their parents are so bad they can't talk i'm not there at least i was 25 when this happened i wasn't 14. so i felt like a responsibility and um and i knew i was not hurting my mother like i really deeply knew there was a moment when things blew up and and it's totally there. It's all transparent in the movie. She runs into a room. She has the, her microphone is still on. It's in the dark. She really like kind of shuts me down. And I say, okay, it's over. Don't worry. And then she recanted because she really understood. But what I want to say is, yes, you can make a film if your family is resistant. 
But what people are really looking at, especially if you're behind the camera, and you don't have to be in front of the camera to make a personal film, like just have to establish yourself. What's so great about the personal film for me is that you, I know who the person who's on the other side of the camera is talking to. And I like having the access between that. It's like, I don't really understand exactly who they're talking to. Like it's Alex Gibney, but I don't know what Alex's relationship is with anyone there. I have a sense of this relationship. The stakes are higher when it's this reciprocity, even if it's a painful one that's going back and forth. And so, but but we can read it. So if your mother, your father, your family member really doesn't want to be there and is really uncomfortable and they don't trust you, the viewer is going to know that. And part of what we're reading is that emotional connection between the two of you, which is is on camera and not on camera. It's this like kinetic force field that's from the from this side of the camera to the other. And, you know, it's the gesture and the pause and the look. It's not even the words. It's like how that person on this side is looking at you. And it's what you're doing together. It's that collaboration. And I, even if it's painful, it's like, okay, I, this is helping us communicate. And through that communication, something better, bigger, healing something's going to happen that hasn't that wasn't on the other side of this storytelling so that's what i think is important and you know whether you get their full compliance or not whatever that is we're going to read it I think, so. I think the other aspect of that is the, the worst thing is when the filmmaker isn't fully committed you know is resisting i mean so many filmmakers i know who go into making personal doc are so ambivalent about being in their own film um, and I always, I, you know, the, the best advice I got was from my friend Peter Friedman, who made Silver Lake Life, and who, um, when, he, when he saw the very first beginnings of my first personal doc, he just said, you know, you, you have to have your neck out there on the chopping block or it won't work. Um, the worst part is when you, you can sense the filmmaker is ambivalent about being in it. You know, either don't be in it or be in it all the way. Um, and, and, and Judith, your thing about her hearing no um, reminded me of my one of my favorite sayings is no in fil and for filmmaking in general, no just means no for now. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you, we'll get around to the question. There's, there's a lot of people who have questions, but I want to ask a few more before we get to it. One of which is the performative aspect of personal doc filmmaking. I'm, I'm lucky in that I'm the camera person on my films and I pick my spots when I'm on camera and they're not, you know, they're, they're at a minimum, but you guys are in it. And yes, I, I just rarely see a personal doc when you're so in it. I mean, the shots of you are so tight on you that you can read every thought, every, everything going through you just comes out so strongly how did you got you're not actors though so how did you get yourself in a state of being in that place where you could be so candid and so emotional um mm -hmm. i'm also thinking of your the, the phone call to your partner yeah mm -hmm. in the film where you break down i mean mm -hmm. how did you set it up for that how did you you know get in that state of mind to do that sure sure well, for, you know, that phone call, um, what, you know, came after I had been calling that former ADA for weeks. Um, and I literally, you know, m my living room became, um, you know, a, a production, um, you know, stage because there was always a camera set up. Um, and, you know, my, my, my DP and I would would schedule days for him to come over to my house and for me to call the the ADA and then to sit there and, and wait and hope that she called me back. And this one day, you know, I had called I had called her office a couple times, um, you know, and you know, I have a landline at home. Um, and when we were eating lunch I saw that she was actually calling me back. Um, and I was and, and see, this is the thing that, that that that's about like directing and being and being also a subject at the same time. When I saw that um, 
that she was calling me back, I was originally and only in that moment, like exclusively and only in that moment, um, William's sibling. Like it was the phone call I had been trying to work up the courage to make for over a decade, right? Wow. Yeah. Um, and so the fact that that, you know, the fact that she called me, I was not thinking about anything other than what she was saying and why. Um, and, you know, the, and, and the breakdown that happens in the call to my partner that happens like that for me, that was just, I was just being Yancey in that moment in, in, in the most, you know, sort of genuine kind of way. And that, you know, and that breakdown was, was, you know, I mean, I see that and I, and I recognize the, the pain of the disappointment in her answer. Um, and I remember the feeling of being like, but you're not going to say anything, you know, to me. And, and that was, you know, that was, that was the moment that, uh, that day. Um, but what about, yes, yeah, what about the, the monologues? I call them monologues, but sure. you know, they would otherwise be narration. You know, but you treated them as on camera um, talks straight to the camera with a framing. You know, we don't even see your full. Thing. Yeah. So that so that framing. So first of all, I'm being interviewed by someone in all of those very tight frames. So there's someone asking me a question, and even though it's cut like a monologue, I'm I'm always and I'm I'm always sort of in response to a question that's been asked to me, asked of me. Excuse me. Um, we settled on that frame because unlike my mother who you can read from a mile away that's just how like expressive a face she has yeah. i tend to be just like I, I just tend to be kind of stoic you know it's just it's just I, I i look at all the baby pictures and little like little yancy pictures um that i have and i've had the same face for my entire life like I'm, I'm generally expression expressionless, even though I feel like, like I am a very expressive person. And so we just needed to find the fucking frame where people were going to be able to see the emotion on my face. And Alan experimented and experimented and experimented. And you know, when he showed me this sort of palette of of frames, um, you know, I looked at them all and I was just like, those two because I can see what I'm feeling in that moment. And I was annoyed at you in that moment. And so I see the annoyance here, but I don't see the, I don't see my emotion anywhere else. And so once we figured out how to capture my emotion in, in the frame, that became the only frame for my character. It's so interesting because a lot of other filmmakers would have shot it, particularly in 4K, they would have shot it wider and had you know the editorial choice of going tight. Yeah. Yeah, but your commitment to that frame felt really apparent, like a real choice from the beginning. Yeah, was it? it was. It, once once I saw it, I was like, okay, that's it. And then I checked it off my list. Like I was, I was also in a, in a place where there was so much going on, having to to balance the different parts of making the film while balancing how I was feeling about making the film. I wanted to make like one decision and then have it crossed off the list. Yeah, you know. And so when I got to that frame, I was like, okay, done don't have to don't have to think about it anymore right judith what about you i mean how well, do you I, I think what yancy just spoke to is really important and something that i hope everyone on this zoom um thinks about and it's i think that when making a personal film collaborate it's like yes it's personal but oddly enough i think I know for myself, I can't make a personal film without other people. It's it's not a it's not a diary <laughs> that you hope someone's going to find one day. Like you are constructing a character, you are constructing something that people are going to consume and engage with and be a part of. And you have to have some really, really, really trusted collaborators who who care for you deeply and also are incredibly honest and who will push back, not because they're trying to seize power or because they're jealous of your voice or anything crazy like that, which can happen for sure, um, but because they're all in it with you. And um, 
And so sometimes, you know, for the performative stuff, it's like, you know, for many of these films, I was working with Dan Gold, who um, was shooting and also co-directing on my last film. Um, I was working with two editors, but with David Cohen for the for the longest part of Love and Stuff, the feature. And we wrote the narration together and I gave him a co-directing credit because we really were deeply collaborating. And so from a performance, I mean, when I, whatever I'm doing on screen, like once I'm there, I'm totally in it. Like I, I am really, I'm actually, I'm having fun. I'm engaged. I am, I'm really trying to, you know, I mean, for the moment before I kind of walk in, I'm like I'm thinking like a director, I'm thinking like a producer, I'm making sure everything's cool, not the title of the movie. And then I walk in and then I'm in. And, you know, and so if, if, if part of my job there is to be a bit of a provocateur and ask a seemingly simple, really naive question, I really am doing that. And I'm really interested in the answer. And I really do like not say anything for 45 seconds until they say something. And then we're both a little like, and then, you know, I know that's good for the movie, but I also know that, like that that's, that's how I probably am with them. It's probably tr really true. So I don't know if it's, if it doesn't really feel performative. It feels like I am honestly engaged in the exploration of what I'm engaging with. And luckily it, 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 it also can cut well. <laughs> and I know that. So. Uh Maybe because I, I shoot my own, you know, I don't have that relationship. Well, I have a very strong relationship with the cinematographer and, you know, we're, we're often at odds, but um, I think, you know, to me, the, the, the strongest collaboration is with the editor. I feel like I, I just have to have a great editor who, um, because you have to think of yourself as a character right. in the film, yeah. you know, gotta and be brutal. You got to be brutal and you got to be objective and you got to go like, OK, what is the arc of this character's story? You know, and where does it begin? Where does it get to? And mm -hmm. and also a very important thing that is is so clear from your films. Um, what is the, you know, the greater social context for the film? You know, is it just about this one family or is this one family part of a bigger systemic problem or issue um uh or or also just how is it universal you know why is this of interest to viewers not just from here but from you know all over the world what what is it that touches on that um so i guess uh last couple of questions for you guys before we go to to everyone else um what were the what were the personal documentaries that made the biggest impression on you, made you, inspired you, or just your personal favorites? Um, mm -hmm. two, two for me, um, uh, Sherman's March, Ross McElwee's films, um, and uh, Sarah Polly's stories we tell, which just, you know, kind of blew me away. Um, but I had already long been doing personal docs by then. Um, I think Ross's is the one that made me feel like, oh, I have permission to, you know, that that documentaries could be as entertaining as any fiction film, could have a sense of humor, could, you know, dig deep into stories, can go in places you don't expect, like it started out as one story and evolved into another. Um, so Judith Yancey, what were, what were the ones for you? Um, for me, it was it was tongues untied. It was Marlon Riggs' masterpiece um, that I've seen so many times that you know it, it's um, it, it really was the film um, that you know for me it was like oh I can take the camera and turn it on myself in a different way and not have a kind of you know outsider's gaze, not be interested in sort of dissecting what I see, but in understanding what I see, um, it was, it was, more, it was, it was Tongues Untied. It still is Tongues Untied and, and other films since then. But, you know, I was, you know, I was, what was it, the early aughts that I started making this film? Um, you know, so it, it, it was, it was really sort of still, um, it was really that film for me. 
Yeah. I, re I remember after Sherman, after seeing Ross's films, I, one thing I couldn't do is like set the camera down and do like a talk to the camera because nobody, nobody does it better. <laughs> I just said, that's not, a, that's not something I'm going to go to. Um, Judith, what about you? Um, well, I think Agnes Varda, I, I love the way that she's been able to kind of look at, you know, big picture questions and always sort of bring it back home and intertwine those in really unique and interesting ways. Um, you know, I think Sherman's March was, you know, was a unique, I think Deborah, um, oh boy, dutiful daughter. Yeah. Complaints of a dutiful Confession. daughter. Complaints of a dutiful, confessions of a, of a dutiful Complaints. daughter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was a really big deal. I mean, that sort of came out at the same time as my film, but I, that always, you know, made a big impression on me. And um, and Strong Island in the most in the most recent period, and the feeling of being watched, are two films that have um, renewed my belief in this form. <laughs> um, find your voice. Make it authentic. Make sure that it feels right in your throat. If you're gagging on your narration, it's wrong. <laughs> if you can't say it because it doesn't feel right, don't. Find the laws of your movie. So for instance, I was not allowed to ever use the word feel in the narration for A Healthy Baby Girl. And then I think I've continued that for all of them. Uh, I never used the word journey, except just right now when I talked about our DNA journey, but I never used that word because it just, it wasn't right. I couldn't do that. Um, it was kind of gross. So um, I, there were rules and I think you have to find the rules of engagement and you have to find your style. Don't be afraid of jump cuts. Don't be afraid of the fact that you forgot to get pick up, you know, cutaways for four and a half years because you were at your mother's house and you weren't thinking like a filmmaker and they were always going to invite you back, which is what I did in Healthy Baby Girl. And then you're kind of like stuck because you will always find a creative way to work yourself out of what seem like seemingly impossible, like, you know, flaws and problems. They all become part of the language of your movie and your very unique voice. Um, and try to find the balance between what is really personal and what is universal. And those are things that have to be happening kind of at the same time, if you can. And don't make narration that feels like a crossing guard. Like, <laughs> surprise us. Tell us something that we don't know, that we could never know, that justifies like the human condition along with your personal human experience. Um, tell things that are really honest that you know everybody else feels, but people aren't embarrassed. But like you know, like eating in the middle of the night uh, because you can't sleep because your mother died. But people brought too much rugula or too much babka, which if you you know you can sort of see what I'm talking about if you see the short that I made for Opdox. But you know, everybody can relate to waking up in the middle of the night and thinking, oh my God, she's still dead? Like, that's not a nightmare. That is the truth. And you can't go back to sleep and you don't know what to do. And you walk around the house and there's no one to call and everyone in California is even asleep. And you're all alone and you're still single and it sucks. And then you go for the babka and it's like, step away from the babka. Everyone loves that because it's true. And you're telling everybody the worst thing. Sometimes I've been known to be a compulsive overeater. And now on top of that, my mother's dead. Uh-oh, don't reach for it, right? All my triggers are here. But like everybody can relate to that. Who doesn't have a trigger? So, you know, don't hold your cards too close to your chest. Be real. So, <laughs> that was epic. Um, I, uh, and now I have to go to a Hanukkah party and not disappoint my seven-year-old. All right, all right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Speaking of, speaking of rules, I um, about 13 years ago, I was asked to um, talk to uh, Anthony Kaufman's class on the filmmaking at NYU. Um, and um, I uh, wound up stuck at the Toronto airport 
and um, I wound, just as a lark, I wrote down 10 rules of personal documentary filmmaking, because I was going to be talking about one of my personal docs there. Um, and I did it just because, um, you know, giving a talk, you know, and particularly at night, half the class would be asleep. And I think, and, and sure enough, when I told them that I had 10 rules, everybody kind of whipped out their notebooks and woke up. I swear to God, Judith touched on five of my 10 rules in the, in the course of her answer there. You know, things like, uh, don't, don't ever say how you feel in your narration. Don't ever use the word journey. Um, you know, the importance of a sense of humor um, and of being yourself. So um, I hadn't read it in the longest time, but I, um, when I was thinking about this thing, I looked at it again and I go like, all right, it kind of holds up. So, um, so I, you know, I throw that out there as my advice. It's, um, uh, this is one of the tougher things, you know, I, I, I joke about the hazards of making documentaries and people talk about shooting in war zones. Um, I, I, I think to myself, uh, you know, shooting with your family is kind of a, a you know, it's, it's a war zone at times. It's as treacherous uh, uh, in its own way.